Hey, what's up, everyone? Um, cool. So welcome if you're tuning in on Facebook uh, or on YouTube. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, this evening, we are talking about uh, secular recovery. And we've got Russell, Russell from Cape Town. Um, Russell S., who's part of... Uh, what, what, what's your group's name, Russell? Oh, this is a commercial break. It's uh, secularserenity.org.za. Secularserenity.org.za. Cool. Thanks for joining us, Russell. And Riona. Riona is with us as well. Welcome, Riona. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> hey. Okay, guys. So um, just quickly, this uh, this is uh, so this is being broadcast on the ARC Facebook page, on the My Rehab Helper uh, profile, a Facebook profile. It's also being broadcast on YouTube as well as the My Rehab Cafe private and unsearchable facebook group okay um so if you guys don't feel comfortable if you're on the private if you're on the maria cafe group and you don't feel comfortable posting anything or or if you want to remain anonymous don't post anything until we switch over to the um to the group exclusively so for the first uh, 10 or 20 minutes we're going to have a conversation on the public platforms and uh, after that we're going to switch over switch over to the group um so Russell, yeah, thank you very much for joining, hey, and thanks for taking the time out to do this. I really appreciate it. I think our viewers do too. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, sec it's, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's very much part of my recovery to do things like this. Uh, it helps me, you know, to stay in recovery. Um, cool. So whether it's these kinds of shares or sharing it at treatment centers or whatever, I try to do that, you know, as part of my, my regime. Do you want to tell us a bit about what secular recovery or, or secular AA is exactly? Sure. Um, so secular AA is uh, part of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and uh, it's it's a part of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, for people who maybe have a problem with God word, uh, who have a problem with uh, some of the fundamentalism that exists inside uh, traditional AA. Um, but, you know, I'm not an AA basher, you know, I got sober in traditional AA, um, you know, I, I got sober in, in, in those, those rooms and, you know, I owe them a huge amount for, um, you know, saving my life to a large extent. Um, but uh, the secular part is came about from uh, what I personally felt as uh, a part of the program that I couldn't deal with. Uh, which is really the, the belief in the supernatural um, and and uh, just some of the, the fundamental kind of rules which I can explain uh, along the way. Um, so eventually, you know, uh, if you want change, then you need to be the change, uh, somebody told me. So uh, my sponsor and I, uh, my sponsor was, was also an atheist, uh, or is also an atheist, but he's not my sponsor anymore. Um, he, uh, um, he and I decided that we needed a secular meeting uh, in, in Cape Town because we, could, we were really getting quite a lot of uh, um, alienation and, and uh, admonishment from, from regular AA because we were speaking our minds about things that we felt were quite dangerous that people would share. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of those things being... Uh, the fact that uh, you shouldn't take any depressants because if anything is mind-altering or mood-altering uh, in AA, then it's taboo. Uh, it's against the rules. You're not sober. And I know that for myself that if I don't have my anti-anxiety and my antidepressants, um, you know, that I become a wreck very quickly. So, uh, and I think that's dangerous. I think, you know, there's nobody in, well, not nobody, there's lots of, bodies in AA that are doctors, but, uh, you know, let your psychiatrist decide if you need to have uh, any depressants or not. Don't, don't let the rooms decide that for you. So I felt that was dangerous, and if somebody says that in a meeting, then I would speak my mind out about it. Um, you know, so it, it got to a point where I'll end up doing a share um, at a traditional AA meeting, um, and I explained that I don't have a higher power. You know, I, don't, I, I did have a sponsor at, both, at that time. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't do the 12 steps as written. I've got my own version of the steps. I don't believe that there's a 
one size fits all recovery. I think each of us are, are different and unique and we need to take accountability and responsibility for our own recovery and what better way to do that than to write your own steps and abide by your own rules, you know. Um, and I did this share at a traditional meeting and the uh, reaction from some of the people was, wow, that's really impressive and there was a you know, the majority of the people were like, you don't belong. Um, and somebody in the room actually stood up and said, if you don't have a higher power, you might as well go out and carry on drinking and get drunk now and wait till your higher power comes to find you and rescue you. And, mm. and that was the last traditional AA meeting I went to, to be honest. Um, okay. So the secular movement, which is, which is the fastest growing part of Alcoholics Anonymous in the world. If, if Alcoholics Anonymous has a number of different subgroups. They've got uh, men-only groups. They've got LGBTQI different groups for all those different uh, uh, gender gender relation things. Um, they've got uh, um, well, gender identification, sorry, uh, things uh, groups. Um, they've got uh, um, African American groups, they've got Hispanic groups, you know, there's all kinds of different subgroups inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that are in mm. Alcoholics Anonymous. And the secular AA is the boss of the smaller groups that is growing, you know, even much more than traditional meetings. So most meetings are becoming very much secular. Um, and in fact, our meeting, we have, uh, well, we haven't seen him for a while, but he's around for uh, a guy who's actually a Roman Catholic that comes to our meetings. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah? We don't, we don't, we don't reject him. You know, we love him, and uh, because we don't have any opinion really about whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't make a difference to us. As far as he's going mm. sober is really the big question. Um, and he says there's much more spirituality in our meeting than any traditional meeting that he's ever seen. And, and I think what he means by that spirituality part of it is that we, it's honest, it's raw. Our meeting, you know, we talk about the real stuff. And it's none of like, oh, well, I couldn't find a parking bay and my higher power came to my rescue and put one right in front of me, you know. Um, and uh, then I was on time for my meeting or some bullshit like that, that you know, mm. that, I mean, it's just nonsense. Mm. Um, so, you know, so it, traditional AA, it was just, you know, that it, I got sober in their rooms. I'm grateful to them. I'm thankful for what they did for me. Uh, and I'm thankful that they managed to help me to find the secular movement of AA itself. Mm. Well, so I relate to everything that you said. Um, I think uh, I'm just going to mute your mic uh, when, just for the moment. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Russell, tell me something. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, quite surprised by by a lot of what you said. Um, you know, the the anti-medication sentiment is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I've, I've I, you know, I haven't confronted directly, to be honest, in any meetings or, um, you know, I've had conversations with people about it, but it sounds like you really kind of, uh, you know, put yourself out there and, and made your opinions known or your, your feelings known um, in that, in that, you know, that meeting that you spoke about. Um, so I mean, obviously, um, you've obviously seen a lot of that anti anti medication kind of sentiment, have you? Yeah, a fair amount. I mean, I've seen uh, anti anti smoking sentiment as well. Why do you smoke? Oh, because it helps to relax me, uh, or because I'm addicted to nicotine, or whatever. Oh, but that's mood and mind altering. You can't smoke, you know. I mean, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I say, you know, I do recovery my way. I do what's good for me, and you know, the the key thing I think for for me anyway in recovery is do my actions have consequences uh do they make my life unmanageable and if i stop taking my antidepressants and the anti-anxiety medication fuck yeah it i will have consequences and i will become unmanageable <laughs> so yeah. i have to take it <clears throat> to keep me manageable and without too many consequences in my life so i have to take them um and you know there's a lot of uh um uh, I don't know, link chain, I don't know, uh, uh, between mental illness and addiction, um, you know, because I wasn't just an alcoholic, I was addicted to everything known to man, you know, so, mm -hmm. I, uh, it, it, you know, and I've, I've been using since I was like 12 years old, and I'm, 
from in my 60s now. So, um, so you know, it, it took. You know, my brain was was wired badly, and I managed to help my my brain to become more unwired badly. You know, went more badly unwired hmm. um, by just you know self medicating with all kinds of different substances and and and, and behavior. Hmm. Um, so uh, you know, so I'm going to try now and and try to to use my brain as a as like a normal person. My brain isn't like a normal person, whatever a normal person is. My brain needs medication to get me to a level where I can behave in a more normal kind of way, uh, if I can say that. So there is like this, there is this anti medication uh, lobby, you know. Um, it's just Bizarre, you know. I mean, we've got a guy that uh, comes to our um, secular serena meeting, and he's uh, microdosing on psilocybin, uh, and he's doing very well. So, you know, um, okay. it's, it's what works for you. You know, I'm not advocating that you go out and buy yourself a pack of magic mushroom, but yeah. you know, he this is his doctor put him on to this particular microdosing, and he, you know, he's sober. Yeah. Um, so I'm not advocating that you know that you take you self medicate. I'm mm. you know tell your doctor to find, tell him that your head's like a washing machine like mine and talk mm. to him and he he will help you and bring balance to your brain. Well, mm. that's what happened to me. I can only talk about my own experience, really. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not here to give anybody advice. I'm mm. not here to counsel anybody. You know, but mm. um, you know, so there there is quite a there was quite a lot of that going on where it's like this anti-medication thing going on and that just to me is just dangerous um, Absolutely, yeah. There's a, yeah there's a, a wonderful doctor in canada his name is gabor mate uh who treats who treats addiction I mean, still treating addiction in uh, in uh, vancouver i think um and he reckons that most uh, of addiction starts in childhood trauma. He's got some fantastic. Uh, here's a fantastic YouTube video called "The Wisdom of Trauma," which I highly recommend anybody to watch. Uh, but he's written some fantastic books as well, many. Uh, two mm. of which are, are, I think, are very relevant. One is called uh, "Scattered Minds," and the other one's called uh, "In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts." Um, and that's another thing about fundamental AA that really irked me. And uh, um, is that you know you're only allowed to talk about uh, conference-approved literature in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, what that means is that you can only talk about the books that they publish. You know, these are the books that we talk from in the meeting. You know, so you're R- Russell, talking- uh, you know, mm. I've 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 sat. Uh, sorry, let me just. I've sat in a in a meeting. I sat in a meeting once. I'll never forget this. And um, this guy, there, there were actually three of us in the meeting. Um, and oh no, so four of us. Okay. And one of the guys pulled out a poem that he, that he'd, I think he'd written it to his kids, you know, you know, like it's like metaphorically, it was, you know, his kids were young and he read this poem to the rest of us in this, in this group. And when he'd finished, he folded it up and put it back in his pocket. And this one guy, very much a fundamentalist, um, popped up and he said, listen, you know, we all need to disregard that. It was not a, it's not, it's not found in the text. <laughs> Um, it was. I was. It was shocking. Yeah. yeah so. No, I, so uh, yeah. Okay. So the the first thing uh, the budget just needs to be quiet here. Uh, the <laughs> first thing is that uh, the the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was written in 1938 uh, by a drunk uh, on a bed with a with a legal pad and a pencil. Uh, went through a number of iterations. You know. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there was a core group, I don't know, the first 10 people or whatever in, you know, and they, they managed to put this thing together. And, um, I think originally it was, uh, an idea to make, have a sort of like a money making scheme, but eventually that got shelved and they made it sort of like open to everybody for nothing, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, in 1935, they didn't have the, uh, knowledge that we have now about the brain they didn't have the knowledge that we have now about addiction they didn't have the knowledge that we have now about alcoholism um you know and things have changed they you know that they, they, they didn't you know there's, there's an amazing amount of literature out there uh that is very very relevant to my recovery mm. um you know one of the um 
the most profound book that I read early in recovery was a book by a fellow by the name of Eckhart Tolle. The book is called The Power of Now. Mm. And it was incredibly profound for me because what that told me was that I am not my brain. My brain is just a, another organ in my body. You know, like, like my lungs' job are to filter my nicotine filled air. Uh, my heart's job is to pump blood around, and my kidneys' job is to do whatever kidneys do, and whatever's left of my liver does what my liver does. And my brain's job is to think. And fuck me, it can think millions of thoughts a second. And you know. It, it's, you know, and some of them, or most of them, are like really about how useless and worthless I am as a human being. Not so much anymore, but in early recovery, it was like, you know, my self-esteem was in the toilet. And, you know, I'd latch onto these things, you know, and it would be a stupid thing. It would be like, oh, I, I, need, uh, I need to cut my toenails, or why don't you cut your toenails? Because I'm so fat and I can't bend and reach my toes. Oh, why are you so fat? Because I'm a junkie and an addict and an overeater. Fuck my life, I want to die. You know, and it goes mm. so quickly to that spot from just like, because my mm. head is like a wash machine, you know. Mm. So, um, so you know, it, it's it's changed. Life has changed, you know. Mm. And, and, mm. and, and the whole way of thinking about these things. And Eckhart Tolle's book told me about how I can observe my thoughts. I am not my brain, right? My brain is just an organ in my body and it does what it does, it thinks. And I have mm. to learn to see what it's doing and be the observer of my thoughts. And if there's mm. thoughts that I don't like, I just sort of imagine them like a cartoon speech bubble and I press the delete key and then they go away, you know, it's like mm. a cloud that mm. But mm. But before I'd read that book, I would latch on to these thoughts, you know, what is wrong with me, you know, why am I so fucked up, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like, Get involved in this, and it would just make me more and more depressed, you know, and mm. depression leads to drinking, you know, or like using or whatever. So, what are, uh, they, what are they morbid reflection? I think they they call it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, and that is a, a profound book, and his second mm. book, which is called The New Earth. I don't make money out of it, but um, <laughs> you know, is they just so they just so good at at like really connecting dots for me, you know. Mm. One of the other things that I had to learn, and, and you'll see this a lot in fundamental AA, is fundamental AA to a large extent is like a stage. There's, everybody wants to get on the stage and have their peace and make themselves feel good about what they said, you know? Mm. It's, mm. It, and that is the thing uh, which Eckhart uh, Tolle talks about. And there's a, another book by a fellow by the name of Ryan Holiday called Ego is the Enemy. And that's about ego. You know, it's about how I would bullshit the world about how fantastic I was because I didn't, I didn't like myself, you know. Mm. Uh, so I would never tell the truth about, you know, Russell. So, mm. uh, you know, so I learned how not to, not to let my ego rule my life um, mm. uh, and, and, and not to, not to showboat, um, you know. So, and things that I said in traditional AA, like attraction rather than promotion, it's a fantastic saying. They should only behave by it in the room, you know. Because the guys are getting up there and telling. I mean, if if I ever hear a guy start his 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 share and he says, "Well, I've been thirty five years sober," I don't want to listen to another word he says because you know this is a one day at a time program, and mm. he's been twenty four hours sober if he's like, you know, and that's mm. that's the way that life. And if somebody starts off, I've been 35 years sober because he's looking for credibility, then he's not credible. I don't want to know how long you've been sober. I want to know how happy you are. I want to know the mm. quality of your life, you know, the quality of your sobriety. Because I know guys who haven't had a drink for 30 years and they're miserable fucks. <laughs> So we've got a comment. Uh, before we go over to the comments, I just want to ask a quick question, Russell. Um, so tell me, like, uh, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong movement away from fundamentalist AA, right? Okay. Um, I'm assuming there's, there's different literature that you, might, you guys might uh, um, have specific to secular AA. Um, that's the one part of the question. The second part of the question is, I mean, why even associate it with, with Alcoholics Anonymous? What is the, um, 
sort of, uh, you know, what is that really all about? Okay, so the first question, we don't have any literature. There's lots of books out there, whatever fancy. If you want to bring it to my meeting and speak about it or to any uh, secular meeting, you find something that's interesting, be it an article on the internet, be it a book, um, you know, that's not a problem for, for secular AI. Uh, we did, um, in, uh, at the beginning of lockdown, we started reading a book which is called Staying Sober Without God by a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Munn. This is an excellent book for me. I thought it was absolutely excellent. Probably the best practical guide to the 12 steps that I've ever seen. A uh, really superb book um, that, uh, uh, that is out there. And uh, so we read that whole book from cover to cover. Um, I guess we finished it um, in February this year. So we started in, in, in 21, I think. Um, and uh, so there's no luck. This is secular AA literature. Okay. Mm. So the other part of the question was, well, why I belong to AA in the first place? Mm. Well, yeah, you know, it's very difficult to start a, I don't want to go and start a new uh, um, kind of, I don't know, uh, can I call it a new recovery program? Let's call it Russell's Recovery and try to get people to join. It's very difficult to do that. The, mm. the credibility of Alcoholics Anonymous is really important, not only for us, but for Alcoholics Anonymous itself, because that was, for me, one of the things that, when I first went into recovery, I didn't, you know, that wasn't like uh, on my to-do list, you know, it wasn't like, mm. okay, I'm going to go to rehab and, and get, you know, it wasn't there, you know, I got to a stage in my life where my life was, you know, completely in the toilet and I didn't want to live anymore. So when I did get into into uh, rehab, I was very grateful to be exposed to to some of the stuff that comes out of AA. And AA was the thing that you know I'd heard about. I hadn't heard about smart recovery or cognitive behavior therapy or any of these other things. I'd heard of AA and I'd heard of NA. And I think those were like I mean I think I'd heard of uh, sex I, I, You know that was like all that I knew when I went in there because I don't mm. I don't you know. You know, one of my favorite things right now to say is when I get a lot of questions, I don't know, because I don't know everything. But mm. when I went there, all I knew was there was this thing called AA, and I didn't know much about it, you know. Um, the fact is, when I went in the rehab and I saw the word God on the wall, you know, I thought I'd actually been kidnapped by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, this was not where I wanted to be. Um, but be that as it may, the, the thing that kept me going back was the proof, the evidentiary proof, and it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a published number, it's not a, uh, uh, there's been no kind of clinical studies that I know of, uh, because it's Alcoholics Anonymous, so we don't know what the fuck's going on, but it's, you know, because it's anonymous, but I've heard that people got sober, and they got their lives back together by going to a Mm. I wanted to get my life back together. I wanted to get clean. I wanted to get sober. This was the this was the route that was available to me. So mm. why secular AA? Well, it because it already existed within AA. So mm. uh, the same way that you know the men's only group or the, the the lesbians group or whatever it is, it already exists as part mm. of of the traditional thing, mm. but without all the fundamentalism, you know, and mm. the, the thing is, is that secular AA is backed by statements that the founder of AA, Bill Wilson, made himself, because, you know, he he said, you know, in many different articles that the only, only requirement for membership to AA is a desire to stop drinking. I wanted to stop drinking. Then my desire was there. That's the only requirement for membership. The mm. rest of it, is all bunk, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And even as far as he was concerned to some extent, because, I mean, the other founder, the fellow, Dr. Bob, you know, he was a bit more religious, I think, uh, you know, and a lot of the God stuff crept in from there. There was another guy in, in the beginnings of AA, Ernie Kurtz, who written a, uh, uh, also written some books about, you know, not God and, and similar kinds of things. But, you know, I immersed myself in recovery to find what worked for me. 
you know. Mm. I had to because I was mm. going to kill myself, you know. So I immersed myself in literature, in understanding, in reading, in watching videos, listening to podcasts, you know. And, and a lot of what we learn or what I've learned in recovery is not actually that new because I've, I've been studying philosophy as well, um, you know, as a sort of like occasional student, not, not like a, as a full-time student or anything, but I just love philosophy. And, you know, there's people that had this thing waxed long ago, you know, mm. about, about how to actually the recipe for life. How do, how do you live a proper, healthy, uh, noble life? And, you mm. know, you can go and read Plato, you can read Aristotle, you can read Socrates, you can read Confucius, you can read the Tao Ching. You know, there's loads of this stuff. And they knew, they knew, and this was 2,000, 3,000 years ago, they knew about how to live a proper life you know, and what were the things that actually mattered to be a decent human being. I didn't know that. It was mm. never taught to me at school, you know. Um, mm. So I had to learn. Oh. Um. Riona, you disappeared. Oh, she's back. So, so you mentioned philosophy. We we've got a, 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 a somebody who's got their doctorate in philosophy watching us. In fact, so shout out, shout out to you, uh, Marco. Um, uh, thank you for watching. I, uh, I see you joining in a lot um, these days. Appreciate the support, and I think we we all do. Um, Riona, Riona, so unmute your mic and ask a question. Uh, she won't let me unmute. Oh, there we go. Oh, she's unmuted. There you go. Riona? She doesn't want to say anything. So I've got some, you know, um, I've got some thoughts on the fundamentalist thing. Um, you know, I, I, I personally, th you know, the 1935, when uh, Bill and Bob uh started or did their first meeting or whatever it was um was the same year that uh the um lobotomy was performed for the first time and um you know you mentioned psychiatry having come a long way you know the, the you know the, the i think the first uh the first uh what's it penicillin which is an antibiotic the first antibiotic was only invented in 1945 um you know so there are some fundamental truths for, you know that that come with uh you know the 12 steps and and um i think there's you know there are definitely some spiritual elements but you know there are a lot of things that i disagree with and that i think uh don't you know people don't need to hang on to every single last bloody word um you know in order to sort of um have some version of recovery you know, and I, that's what I really like about what you've um, what you've said. A lot of people have have said that uh, um, secular AA is a wing of the same bird, basically. It's just another wing of the same bird, and it sounds to me like that's not necessarily entirely the case. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of cool um, elements to secular AA. Um, Riona, if you're going to participate, you have to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay. Yeah, but my signal sucks. So sorry. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Go what ahead. is the what question? question? No, no, you what need to ask question? the question. I need to ask. Oh, yeah. no, I think you're sitting. Hi, um, Russell. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Mostly good. good. Mostly good. I love the fact that you, what did you say about your head being a washing machine? I totally relate to that shit. Um, oh, are we allowed to say shit? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did give a disclaimer at the start of the of the video, so <laughs> <laughs> so I can say shit. <laughs> um, and I, that's I'm, about it I'm, for Riona. <laughs> nah, ah, come on, Russell said the f word. What <laughs> his journey is is their own. I think how you recover personally like who i am at night on my own whether i believe in god or not is how i am recovering and if i'm a better person today and if and if i've healed and grown and my behavior has changed then then i'm all right with my with with my recovery and how it's going i'm actually quite 
I've never been happier, <laughs> actually. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I love your badge, so by I, the way. If I can comment on that, Rowan, I think, you know, the... The, the medication thing, and I don't want to sort of get stuck on this, but the medication thing really comes in. I think one of the one of the main sort of things around medication is is where there's dysfunction. Okay, so if there's a if there's a lot of dysfunction, um, and you're living a clean life, but there's still that dysfunction, um, mm. you know that that's when somebody might need to look at. At meds, and you know the question then might be, okay, well, who gets to decide whether there's, a, a, you know, there's dysfunction or not? And I think that really comes down to the person, you know. Um, well, my well, my problem is, is like top, top, clever, clever, clever men, doctors, and everything, and one will prescribe me this shit, and then another will prescribe me this, and this one will say, no, this cock's bad, and you must try that one. So everybody, like everybody's opinion is different and you can't like for me i felt like a bit of a guinea pig with the meds and i and i fully agree if you need meds you go and get them you know if you need them your psychiatrist knows if you need them your therapists know if you need them you you do what you need to do to live a happy happy life um and if that means taking a pull every morning go ahead that's your journey i'm not going to judge you for it though and i think that's the problem i have is the 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 amount of hypocrisy that goes on about it it's like who the hell are you to mm. tell me how to recover that pisses me off. i don't like a mm. hypocrite and yeah mm. so that's my any comments on that russell yeah yeah uh it's it's interesting you know i mean i've had the same psychiatrist ever since i went in fact he was the guy that, that put me in rehab um so uh you didn't tell me i was going to rehab um, he put me into uh, anti-depression clinic first on suicide watch for three weeks. And then uh, after that, he said, well, I think you should actually now go to something that's called CDU. So I said, what CDU? And he said, well, it's like, you you know, you've passed the anti-depression stage. You need to go to the next class. So it was like it was appealing to my, my ego. So it was like I was graduating from the depression clinic into the next class and then i got to cdu and that was actually the rehab because cdu stands for chemical dependency unit so i was like <laughs> really i was like really tricked into going in, going to rehab in, in a lot of respects i mean you know i thought after i come out the depression clinic, you know i'll just i'll take it easy i won't drink as much i won't use as much i won't you know and i'll just carry on but you know anyway then i, I did land up in, in the in rehab and I haven't I've been sober ever since, you know. Um, oh wow. But I do I do have a friend who uh uh who's bipolar and she's a, she's a funny girl. Um and uh she, you know when she takes her meds she's wonderful and then she'll find me up and say I'm having such a shit day and I I really I can't understand why my life's so bad and it's like are you taking your meds? She said, no. I said, well, why did you stop? She said, I was feeling much better. Feeling fine. Yeah. 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 So dangerous. Don't take, don't take your meds, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, you know, that's what was keeping you fine. Now, you know. Yeah. And she's, yeah. A, she's a bright girl. You know? She's not a silly girl. So, but there's um, such a, still such a stigma attached to it. And, I, and that's the dangerous part of it. It's so, and I, 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 it's terrible. I think it's terrible, terrible. Because there's, I think that it's been a lot more, I mean, mental wellness and mental health is a lot more in the spotlight now. And it's a lot, it's almost a bit more um, accepted. And I don't think you need to be a junkie or an alky to, to um, have, have, you know, have problems like that. I think most of the, most of, well, I think the whole world's a bit fucked. Sorry, Ryan. So, uh, like, find me somebody who isn't on medication these days, including three-year-olds. So, you know, what works, what each to their own is my thing. If that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. Mm. Yeah. So my, my journey was, my, my journey was different to yours, Riona. I, I went into treatment um, and I wasn't, you know, diagnosed by psychiatrists and Put on all different meds and all the rest of it. I, I went into treatment, got out, got into a halfway house. I was in the halfway house for uh, about nine months. Got out of the halfway house, um, and still was still continued seeing my counselor. 
And my counselor and my sponsor both said to me, listen, dude, you need to go and see somebody. You don't make yeah. sense when you try and form sentences. Um, you're all over the place. Things are not, you're not well. Um, and I didn't want to believe that. I was like, you know, it wasn't uh, something I would, wanted to believe that there was something else wrong with me and I needed to go and get on meds now. But uh, anyway, I, you know, things, there was a lot of dysfunction despite the fact that I was clean and sober and life was really, really difficult for me. Um, oh. and, uh, you know, I went and did the responsible thing, like you mentioned, uh, Russell, you know, I went and saw the, the, the doctor, um, uh, had a conversation with him about it, researched the meds, you know, uh, got, got on the meds, decided that I was well again, went off the meds without telling anybody. And my sponsor said to me one day, he said, listen, are you off your meds? And I was like, yeah, he's like, well, don't talk don't phone me again until you get back on your meds and he's in a lot of ways um i would i would say somewhat fundamentalist from a from a 12 step point of view he's not a he's not a nazi like i like to call them the the you know um. now, i just want to say um the meds that i'm on now are not the same meds that i started with mm. um um uh, we've I've been through a process with, with my psychiatrist to find the right combination uh, of, yeah. what I'm, of what I should be taking because, uh, you know, the original ones had other effects uh, in my life that, that were not desirable, um, you know, so it's taken a while to get, you know, to that stage or it took a while to get to the stage where I have what, you know, uh, what I think is a good combination, but it's something that we discussed. You know, uh, quite regularly is, you know, should we be dropping some of it? Should we be upping some? Of it? You know, it, 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 it's not a, you know, the thing is, is that, and it's like my steps. My, as I've grown in recovery, so my steps have changed. Because yeah, they, for sure. Some, some of them became irrelevant. And some, of mm. the, some other things became much more relevant in my life. Mm. Um, I agree with you. Yeah. So, you know, when I did my steps originally with my sponsor, he started with a thing called Step Zero, which was incredibly important. And I never heard of Step Zero before. And and the Step Zero was was the thing is, is that I have a disease. And it's not my fault. I've, I, I've got this disease. Sure. Uh, it's called addiction. It's called alcoholism. It's called whatever. And it's not my fault. It's like I just got it, you know, like somebody got the big C or somebody got, you know, some other kind of, somebody broke a leg, bad luck. You got this disease and it doesn't matter if it's genetic or hereditary or if you caught it from a fucking toilet seat, it doesn't matter. What matters is it's you got it. <laughs> bad luck. Right? And the other part about step zero was that if you don't do something about this disease, it will fucking kill you. And that was a really important thing, the step zero for me, to understand that it wasn't my fault. It, it's not because I'm a bad person. It's, it's you know, it's oh wow. And then you know, then we oh wow, to, I like that. And then we went to step one, and he said, "So how's your life?" So I said, "Well, you, I'm here in rehab. What do you think?" I'm pretty fucked up. <laughs> like, okay, step one, thing. pretty sure. That was, that, that was exactly how I did step one. Exactly. Step one finished because my I recognized that my life was like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then the second step was, uh, well, do you, have you ever tried to stop? I said, geez, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to stop using it. He says, mm. do you need help? I said, yeah. He said, okay, step two finished. And that was the end of it. Then we got to step three, and then all the wheels came off. And, uh, you mm. know, the thing is, is that he, we just couldn't go forward from there because that was step three. So he said, you know, go and write your own step three. And I went away and I thought about it and, you know, and I wrote my own. I only got eight steps out of it. I didn't do 12 steps. I only got eight. Um, I still only have eight, actually. Um, but they have changed. They've evolved as I've grown as a human being. And 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 as, as I have become a better person, so my steps have changed to evolve with me. Um, and oh, yeah. you know, so it's my recovery. It's not there's no one size fits all, you know, and there's no one size fits all psychiatric drug to help you, you know. There's no one yeah. size fits all. No, anything. 